Just wanted to thank you all, our esteemed panelists, for joining us today. This session is um, around celebrating, as you know, the convention for this year is around celebrating diversity within the sickle cell disease community. And this session is really designed to provide an opportunity for you to hear the stories of people who are living with sickle cell disease. So again, we thank you for that. I'm going to ask each person that's on our panel to introduce themselves, and then they're going to respond to a couple questions, and then I think we'll have opportunity for questions and answers at the end. So for each of the panelists, if you can just share your name and where you're from, um, the ethnic group that you identify with, and your diagnosis. So we just take turns going down. I am Dr. Patrice Holden, and I identify as African American. I have uh, sickle cell disease um, type SS. And where are you from? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I uh, reside in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Hello, I am Ijama Azubako. Um, I have sickle cell type SS. Um, I'm from a lot of places, <laughs> but I'm originally um, from Houston, Texas. I currently reside in Gabon, Central Africa. And before I went to Gabon, I was living in the D.C. area. So. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Lala Adeshina. I reside in Connecticut. I have sickle cell disease type SS complemented by alpha thalassemia trait. And I identify as both a Nigerian and an American. Good morning. My name is Shawnetta Richardson. I reside in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I have sickle cell anemia disease, type SS. Um. Hello. <laughs> My name is Tristan Lee. I'm from Williamsport, Pennsylvania. I have sickle cell anemia, type SS, and I am a fashion designer. Hello, my name is Doris Polanco. I'm from Dominican Republic. I was born and raised in New York in the Bronx. And um, I'm a big advocate for sickle cell and also a yoga instructor. Awesome, thank you. We've already heard some amazing stories about um, people that are living with sickle cell disease. Can you share a little bit about um, when you were diagnosed and what your family's response was when they found it? Okay. We apologize. <laughs> well, um, my mom is from a large family. She's from a family of uh, 12. So when I was born, uh, she indicated that there were problems from the start, um, that I cried a lot. There would be times when I would refuse food um, and times that I would scream for periods of 24 to 48 hours. So she had an inkling that something was wrong. It did take her six months for the medical community to figure out that it was actually sickle cell disease and not colic or the baby spoiled or she has a fever. So I was diagnosed at six months old and um, the doctors weren't very positive about the long-term prognosis. They said, this child won't live past three, so do not get too attached to her because she, she won't be around. At that point, my parents decided this in fact is not the prognosis that we will accept so my mother uh, agreed um, at my father's suggestion to retire from work and that her exclusive job would be to make sure that that didn't happen. So we spent a lot of time in doctor's office pretty much my entire childhood, but my mother, I give her um, you know, just infinite respect for the wisdom that she had. So instead of you know, talking to the other parents or reading magazines or watching TV, from the time that I could track, so from three months, four months, five months, six months, she would be pointing out letters and she would be tracing them with her finger. And so people thought she was insane because they would ask her, what are you doing and who are you talking to? And she would say, the baby. And so um, by her tracking letters and then when she thought that I was following along, when she would say A and she thought that I would track the letter, you know, the appropriate letter, she started teaching me sounds. Consequently, by the time I was three, I could read at the third grade level. Currently, I have a PhD in communication, so I just credit my parents to focusing on the possibilities that they believed in and having the faith um, that the prognosis that the doctors gave them was not indeed the journey path for my life. 
We can give a round of applause for that. <laughs> so um, I was diagnosed as, as a newborn. Um, I actually have a twin brother, um, and we both and we both um, were diagnosed with sickle cell at the same time. So out of our four, four siblings, um, me, my twin brother, my younger sister all have sickle cell, and then my younger brother has the traits, and we were all found out at birth. I was diagnosed at six months. I was actually born in Illinois at that point in time. They didn't have a newborn screening program. It was actually a well baby checkup that my mom had taken me to, and there was routine lab work that was drawn that came back and did not look quite right. And so I was referred to a pediatrician who did further tests to determine my diagnosis. And the reaction that my parents had was um, not amazing. Uh, my, my father had never heard of sickle cell disease uh, at the time and was kind of like, how did she get this? So it was certainly an education point that was presented for both my mother and my father. I need to apologize because that's my 14 month old. <laughs> that's why um, I'm, I keep being drawn over to that area of the room. I'm sorry. Um, but it was also something that my mother had not known much about once I was diagnosed. And that also became a driving factor for her because she ended up switching career paths and devoting much of her career to uh, sickle cell disease and patient advocacy. And I will say that it has definitely been a driving force for me and developed the person that I am today. Hello, I was diagnosed with sickle cell anemia disease at birth. Um, sickle cell runs in my family. My grandmother has it. Um, my uncles, my cousins. So um, Howard University, when they knew that my mom and my dad had, had the trait, they prepared them by having a counseling session or um, teaching them how to care for a child with sickle cell anemia disease. So my family was fortunate because we've been through it before. So that's my story. Thank you. So I was diagnosed with sickle cell at the age of six months, and at the time, I was only the second um, person in my community that was diagnosed with sickle cell, and doctors told my mother and my grandmother that I would not live to be 20, and by the grace of God, you know, I'm still here, thriving and going yeah. strong. <laughs> we believe in prayer, we believe that God has the final say so. So that's kind of what I kept throughout my life. Um, you know, I've overcome many different trials with sickle cell. And I'm the only one in my family who has full blown sickle cell. My mother has sickle cell trait, and so does my father. And my sister also has sickle cell trait. But I am the only one that has full blown sickle cell. And I pray that sickle cell is cured and that it also stops with me as far as my family goes. Hello. Well, my mom, when she was five months pregnant, um, she, they did routine work in the hospital and the doctor called her in and said that some tests came back positive for some. So they told her that I was going to Come, I was going to be born with no spine, and or I was going to have a syndrome. They didn't just they didn't say specifically what. They just basically scared her, mm -hmm. and told her that her best option would be abortion. Yeah. So my mom did not want to go that route. She was already almost five months. By that time, she's like, "Oh no, I'm not <laughs> going to do that." And um, everybody around her, her family, besides my grandmother wanted her to have an abortion because they said, you know, you're too young, you can't care for a sick child, you know, the way they're saying that she's going to be born is going to be crazy, like, you know, don't do it. She kept me, thankfully, 
And um, when I was about three months, that's when they, after several testing, that's when they found out I had sickle cell SC. So from that point on, um, well into the beginning of the diagnosis, they told my mom I wouldn't live till five. So again, like the first young lady said, they told her, you know, don't get too attached, you know, try not to think of future with her, don't think about long-term goals with her because she's not gonna make it. Um, my mom and my grandmother made it a mission to get me healthy, like Dominicans, we think there's so many natural remedies, so any, <laughs> you name it, they've tried it on me, like anything, <laughs> it's ridiculous. But um, yeah, so they just really got me really healthy and I was always, you know, a little chunky, which is not really common for sickle cell babies and children, even up to their teens. They're usually skinny and not that healthy. But, um, but yeah, again, my mom and my grandmother, I would not be here if it wasn't for them. So, Great. thank you for sharing. What about um, the community, your community's attitude towards sickle cell disease and, and how have you been treated um, after they found out that you have sickle cell? Uh, I'm going to answer this question in two parts uh, because I interpret community in two different ways. Community, um, as far as my ethnic community, mm -hmm. um, I faced a lot of, uh, I just felt misunderstood um, pretty immediately. As a child, the foremost goal is to blend in and to be somewhat normal or like the other children. And I immediately was not that. I missed large amounts of school. I always had a tutor. Um, there were physical feats that I could not um, complete. And then there's the pain. And when the pain comes, um, the pain is debilitating. It is loud. It is forceful. I mean, you're basically crying, screaming, sweating, and writhing. And sometimes um, I've been in crises for up to 96 hours. And when I say crises, I mean, active pain where I don't eat, I don't sleep, I'm just sweating and screaming. And so that immediately displaces you from the normal childhood community. So that was, that was hard and I think some of those um, lessons still stay with me as an adult. It was more difficult to make friends because they did not understand and then during the times when I did make friends and we would do natural things like sleepovers, um, if I got sick after that, they didn't want to see me again. Right. Not, um, people weren't forward thinking enough to say, well, maybe she shouldn't spend the night, but let's do a lunch date or let's invite her parents the next time. It was just never again, and um, that was tough. And then as far as the medical community, which is the other way that I interpret the question, um, because of my you know, extreme faith uh, and just divine grace, my parents really did put a lot in me because there would be times that I would come in the house crying because I had been broken down by some cruel thing that a child had said and they would always uh, refocus my attention. They would listen and make sure I felt heard but then they would refocus my attention to the things that I did well and that was always you know, my ability with words and language. Um, so they would say, well, wait a minute, aren't you in the fifth grade? Aren't you reading like on a 11th grade level? Who else in your grade is doing that? And so then I would think about it and I'd run back outside and be like, well, what did you get on your reading score? So I was thankful for them, you know, listening and making sure that I always had something that I did feel confident about because it was tough. And then as far as the medical community, I, um, for the first 26 years of my life, I spent about the equivalent of 18 years of that in the hospital. Um, after that point, I met a doctor who said, you are too talented to be spending your life here. We need to try something else. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I, and he was at Howard University Hospital and I said, okay, okay, because Howard is a teaching hospital. So I figured there was some new drug on the horizon. When I was discharged, he gave me my prescriptions and on the last prescription pad, he had written bullets. So instead of a medicine, which is what I was expecting, he wrote bullet points. And so he wrote six bullet points. I remember about five of them. One of them was volunteer, get a hobby, find some friends, take a class. Um, and I couldn't understand what this had to do with me being ill. The pain was real. The episodes was, were real, my lung failure was real, so I couldn't understand what this had to do with anything. And so I was a little angry with him because I said, are you saying that this is psychological? He said, absolutely not, or I wouldn't be treating you. 
um, and you gave me your word that you would try it. So, I, uh, so when my mom came to the hospital because I was being discharged, she said, well, who's going to hire her with her ability um, her, her ability uh, or her lack of ability to keep a schedule. And so he said he would. So to shorten this story, the doctor had so much faith in me until he hired me to be his office manager out of his own pocket. And he told me that I could work for him for 12 hours a week um, for as long as I could. And so um, when I started working for him, about three days in, I got sick again and I went into the hospital. But this time I was antsy. I was like, look, I don't have two weeks to be here. I have to get out. They're not gonna know how to treat the patients. They're not gonna answer the calls right. No one intrinsically understands that if my, if the, when the patients call and say that their prescription is out, that their life stops at that point. The secretaries don't get it. If I'm not there, that higher level of care is not given. I have to get out of here. And so, um, so that admission took me three days to get out of the hospital. The next time I got sick, I remember I was in bed sweating and screaming, and I was like, "Ma, we can do this, we can do this. I don't need to go to the emergency room, we can do this. And so within six months, my admissions had dropped, and then within a year, I wasn't going into the hospital at all. So I credit this doctor for being different from the normal doctor, because normally it doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're a doctor or whether you're just someone walking off the street. Once they see us, um, we are immediately categorized normally as coming to seek pain medicines. And a lot of times um, in the emergency room, the treatment is already prejudiced by the, the stigma or the forethought that this patient is here either exaggerating or they're here in some way, shape, or form for the medications. And that has completely colored many of the ways that doctors do business with us in the ER and on the floor. Um, I have been profiled on every television station in the tri-state area and also in the Washington Post and all the papers. They treat me the same way. So, um, so I thank that doctor because now my, I go into the hospital maybe once every four years. And the thing that he taught me was a piggyback on the lesson that my parents taught me. And that is that whatever life obstacle that you have, you have to find something that you are intrinsically almost obsessively passionate about. And you have to pursue that thing with everything that you are. Because in the end, that is more medicinal than anything that Western medicine can offer you. How do you change history? You can change history by walking and marching. You can change history by speaking and teaching. You can change history by taking a stand or taking a seat. But the best way to change history is when you becomes we. We tore down that wall. We marched for equality. We made sure that love knew no boundaries. Now you can become we right here in Vancouver. We can end HIV. We can change history. It begins with a test. Testing today can range from a blood test that'll inform you in about a week to some locations where a prick of the finger gets you a result in 60 seconds. Diagnosing HIV early changes everything. It prevents the virus from attacking your body and it prevents it from spreading through our communities. All each of us has to do is step up and take a test. Changing history is that simple. Testing centers are available throughout the city or just ask your doctor at your next regular visit. And if your doctor offers a test, Say yes, it's just the responsible thing to do. Then, share the word. Tell people that HIV treatment has changed. Tell people that testing has advanced. Tell people that the entire approach to HIV is different now. Let them know that by choosing to take a test, we can all end HIV. This is a fact. We are so close. But to become we, we've got to have you. We need you to do your part. We need you to share the word, take the test, join the movement. End HIV. Change history. Learn more at itsdifferentnow.org. I didn't want to talk about it earlier. Why would I want to seem like this sad sack? 
those are all the lies that I told, told myself. It's like, oh, if I talk about this, even, pro even professionally with my job, if I talk about this, uh, people won't want to watch me. It's not important enough. And e even now, as I'm hearing myself saying all those things, like, wow, man, I really wish that I would have spoken out earlier. Because there's nothing like being able to shine a light on those secrets. Those secrets kill. The, the secret of keeping all that to yourself and putting on that mask that'll eat away at you daily. It ate away at me daily. It's difficult for men in general, I think, because of just, just the way that we're made, raised. You feel any of the negative emotions or that dark cloud settle on you and you feel like you need to cry out or speak to someone about it, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do that because my man. What kind of man would I sound like if I told somebody, hey, I am, I'm, I'm so sad, I'm cripplingly sad, I, I can't get out of bed, I just, I, I feel empty, help me. Psst, that would be some sissy, I'd be soft. That's what you're taught. That's what you were programmed. And, uh, and that's what kills us. So in speaking about it uh, on ET and being honest, folks have come out of the woodwork. People that I haven't heard from in years, complete strangers, a ton of my, mostly on Twitter and on Facebook and social media. That's, that, that's been an amazing gauge of all the love and so many people, it's echoed the exact same sentiment. Thank you so much for speaking because I felt that I couldn't. Always ready for action. We can do it in two minutes. Now, when I was in high school, I couldn't do it in two minutes. By the time I got to college, two minutes was a cinch. I really like it when a guy can do it in under two minutes. The key to my marriage is doing it in under two minutes. I can do it in two minutes. I can do it in less than two minutes. I can do it in under two minutes myself and with my boyfriend. Each year, the Red Cross responds to 66,000 disasters. Most of them are home fires. Most of them are home fires. Ooh. I know. Whoa. Seven people die each day on average from home fires. Seven people a day. That's way too many people. You can save your life and your family's life. Make an escape plan. Make an escape plan. Make an escape plan. It's critical that everyone can get out in under two minutes. I can get from my bedroom to my front door in less than two minutes. <laughs> in two minutes. I can take my shirt off, pour glitter all over myself, and still do it in two minutes. Called my mom the other day, told her I did it in under two minutes. She was so proud. One and a half. What? There's no way. Yeah. Check your smoke alarms monthly to make sure they're working properly. Smoke alarms cut your risk of death or injury in half. Half. It's 50%. This little guy, cutting it in half. And if it's beeping at you, don't rip it out of the wall. Give it a battery, you know? Make it happy so it can help you get out of the house in time. Make sure to visit redcross.org slash two steps, two minutes. Two steps. Two minutes. Two steps, two minutes. Visit the link below to find out more. Wherever it is. Not there. Here. Right here.
from my perspective in um, terms of community, um, I say for I'm Nigerian, and it was funny, um, or not funny, but hearing everybody else's story on how they found out how they had sickle cell and when they knew they had sickle cell. My parents didn't really tell me anything about when I found, when I had sickle cell, like what it was. I didn't really know what type of sickle cell I had until I was an adult, but I've known that I've had it all my life. Um, so growing up with sickle cell, it wasn't something that was talked about in the house. Um, my mom was very about like keeping it under wraps, not letting anybody know when you're sick, when you're, you know what I mean, when you're not feeling good. So with that, um, it was something that was never discussed. It was nothing, something that was never talked about even when it came to having crisis. I didn't really go to the hospital unless my mom was like, unless I like told her I have to go to the hospital because um, I feel like she was more so in denial in terms of what was going on and what was happening. Um, so I would say that in um, terms of community, community is the things that, that, um, that I saw. So it's a, it was more like how we talk about it being a silent illness. So I saw it from the perspective of being a silent illness. So even growing up as a child, like I wanted to play sports. I wanted to run track. I wanted to do all of these things. But in more, I would not have the, I mean, I'd run out of breath. I wouldn't be able to do any of these things. I didn't understand why. Like, I didn't know what was really going on with me again because we didn't talk about it. I just knew that I couldn't do the things that other children were doing. And I always knew that I was always in pain. But my mom, the fact that she was an RN, she always felt that she could take care of it at home. So it was, it was hard <laughs> growing up. I think I maybe saw someone that wanted the question repeated, if that's OK. okay. Um, just more the com how your community, um, whether ethnic community, sure. whatever representing, but the, how your community felt about um, sickle cell disease. No problem. And um, I'm going to piggyback onto the Nigerian experience. <laughs> when I was first diagnosed, I'm a middle child of three. My older brother has sickle cell trait, and my younger sister also has SS. And when I was first born and diagnosed, my parents had recently moved from Nigeria to the United States. And my father was adamant about not sharing with his family at home what the diagnosis was. And I was, like I said, it was an incidental finding when I was born at my six month well baby checkup. I was not that sick and I looked like a regular baby. I was chubby, I was happy, I didn't really have any issues. And so uh, my father was even like, you know, maybe they made a mistake on the blood work. What do these people know? She's fine, look at her, she is okay. It wasn't until my younger sister was born at 18 months, had suffered a TIA and um, needed to be hospitalized and then subsequently have chronic transfusions at that young of an age that they ended up calling home to let them know by the way, we have two children with sickle cell disease and this one is sick, we need your prayers, please come and help. And so that was the um, initial response to our diagnosis from my ethnic community back home being a Nigerian. Um, as an American, because I did grow up in the United States, um, it, was, it was very different from what I recall. I always recall growing up knowing that I had sickle cell disease. The interesting thing was, and I think this is sort of where a panel like this is great, is that I wasn't told that I couldn't do sports or I couldn't go outside. I live in Connecticut, I can't play in the snow. I was told I can do it, I just need to make a few changes. I need to make sure that I am staying hydrated. If I'm going outside in the snow, I need to come in after a half hour and warm up before I go back outside. So for me, growing up with sickle cell disease was living life just with a few adjustments. And um, my, like I said, my mother has been a very strong force in the way that I've grown up and talking about sickle cell, she's shoved my sister and I in the front of a few different communities to speak about living with sickle cell disease, even when I was in, I believe, like 
fifth grade or something like that. So I've been speaking to audiences for a little bit. And so having sickle cell disease is just a part of me. And throughout life, I take it as a teaching point for people because I will speak to, oh, you know, I couldn't do this. I was feeling sick. Oh, what was wrong? Oh, I have sickle cell disease. Oh, I've never heard of that. Well, it's a genetic blood disorder, and you know this is how it's affected. So for me, I kind of get tired a lot, but I played soccer, I played basketball, um, I lived what I saw as normal, and um, just with a few augmentations. So it's interesting how our experiences were a little different because once my mom became educated, she made it her point to tell me, yes, you have this, yes, you're living with it, but it's not a death sentence because that is what she was initially told as well. She was like, in Illinois, they told, oh, she has sickle cell disease, she probably won't live till she's 19. You'll just raise her and then bury her. Um, but I've, I'm 34 now. I have a 14-month-old son. I'm thriving. I work full-time. I'm a pharmacist. So we can do it. <laughs> we just need the adjustments. So um, it's, it's interesting to see the uh, different communities that we experience. And I just wanted to go back on what she was saying in terms of just Nigerian. Um, it's funny because, like you said, her mom being Nigerian, she was more open. She got into advocacy. She got into talking about it. My mom, no. Like, she feels you are not supposed to talk about it because you know even with Nigerians, they're the highest um, ethnic group that has with sickle cell. Um, so it's something that's a stigma, you know what I mean, that's stigmatized in the Nigerian community. And so with my mother, she does not, even to this day where I've become more of an advocate, I decided that I need to start speaking out and being more open about it. My mom's like, why are you talking about it? Why are you telling people that you have sickle cell? You shouldn't be, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. Um, and so it's different seeing how you're saying from like your mother's perspective in terms of putting you out there and doing it and my mom she's trying to cover me like yeah. no don't do that yeah. don't talk about it but I feel that because God has blessed me and he's blessed my life that I need to be out there and I need to start talking about it because at the end of the day it's like you people may see it as a weakness but you see that and you push it as your strength and knowing that that's what caused me to be the person that I am um, throughout my life and through the things that I've been doing. So just like she said, I'm 35 years old. I'm out in, um, I'm living out of the country. I'm in Central Africa. I'm in Gabon working, um, you know what I mean, working to help others, um, building out the infrastructure out there. And everything that I've ever wanted to do, everything that I've ever, you know what I mean, like dreamed of, I'm living that life. And so I want to be able to show people, like, you don't have to sit and allow your illness to define you or define, like, your activities or define, like, your role, your job, whatever it is that you do. So just understanding that you may have sickle cell, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you're not normal. Like, you're still a normal, active human being, and it's all about the way that you perceive yourself. And so if you perceive yourself in a specific light, then you'll be able to do those things that everybody else does. So. Great, we're gonna ask, we're gonna talk a little bit more about stigma mm -hmm. in a minute, if oh, you okay. can. <laughs> yep. um, my community, I can speak on family. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can speak on family, um, my community, and the physician side. With my family, they always made me feel love, and they always explained to me that I was always, um, special and my grandmother used to always say God gave you sickle cell because you can handle it everyone can't handle sickle cell so growing up I spent most of my life in a hospital um, I would get sick in school the kids would look at me they would laugh they would bully me and you know, just being carried out by ambulance while you were at school, and that, that just singled you out right there. And then it became uh, limiting, and you know, when kids don't know, mm -hmm. they tease you, they talk about you, and until they find out what you're really going through. And my mom made it a priority to go up to the school to talk to the kids about sickle cell anemia disease and how it affected me. So the bullying and 
the ridicule turned into love. They would send like, um, draw little cars and say, get well soon, I hope I see you soon. And it was very limiting because I couldn't do as much as everyone else did when I was growing up. So sickle cell was limiting in my younger days. Growing up with um, sickle cell, I had, I spent a whole year in a hospital because sickle cell paralyzed me. I couldn't do anything from the neck down. So I spent every holiday in the hospital more than one time. So I wasn't able to spend Christmas or New Year's or 4th of July with my family at home. I was always in the hospital. And then my mom came up with a creative idea. 4th of July, she would go by my hospital window and just shoot fireworks so I could still <laughs> get the experience. Oh <laughs> and she would keep the Christmas tree up until March with my gifts so I could still feel the experience. Um, growing up, even in my adulthood with sickle cell, I struggled a lot even with uh, obtaining a job, no matter how many college degrees I have. Um, if you're sick and you're in a hospital, I've got fired while I was in a hospital. Um, I had a supervisor. When I told her that I have sickle cell anemia disease, she said, well, what is that? Is that really a disease? I have to research that. So it's very important that we spread awareness um, my doctors, I had, a, I had awesome doctors, amazing doctors at Howard University Hospital, still do, and I have praying doctors. I have doctors that, that commit their lives to sickle cell, that when I was in intensive care for the first eight months of my child's life, my doctor would come in and pray over me three times a day and make sure I was good. My doctor is the one who gave me my first job, and he said, oh, you're going to be all right, sweetie boo. But doctors, Dr. Uwe Lee, Dr. Randolph, Dr. Sohal Reiner, Dr. James Teller at Howard University Hospital has been a part of my family. I mean, they make it to my weddings, they make it to my college graduations. They are really committed to sickle cell and trying to find a cure for sickle cell. Okay, thank you. Uh, No two days are alike. So every day, you prepare. For yourself. For those you love. For whatever the day may bring. Being prepared is a part of who you are. But in the case of a disaster, preparation isn't always front of mind. In an emergency when help and resources may not be available for days, being prepared is more important than ever. It's up to everyone to be informed about what types of emergencies might occur where you live or visit. Knowing the best responses for your personal circumstances is the key to maintaining your health, safety, and independence. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency and how a personal support network can assist you. Build a kit that contains the specific things you need to survive for several days. Food and water, medication and supplies, as well as any important documents you may need. Being prepared is a part of who you are, and disaster preparation is no different. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, get involved. Ready.gov slash my plan. No. 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 No lupus. No lupus. If we're going to say no to lupus, we need to know lupus. <sighs> lupus has completely changed my life. 
Lupus is one of those things that takes over somebody's body and you don't know anything about it. It's just unpredictable, it's tricky, confusing. There's certain things that I can't do, but I still get up every morning and do it. It's really a cruel mystery. Lupus can impact any organ in the body, any organ. It was attacking my kidney. Some people, it's the brain, it's the heart. I had gone into stage four kidney failure, which sent me into respiratory failure, which almost made me lose my life. When I was first diagnosed, that's when it really kicked in, just knowing that there was no cure. I really felt like maybe I might not be able to make it through this. We don't look like we have the disease, and I think that's also part of the problem. You can be sick even though you don't look sick. That is one of the cruel aspects of it, is there sometimes people don't believe you. Lupus does not discriminate. It can affect men, women, white, black, older, younger. I've had lupus for 10 years. I am 17 years old. I am 11. We've got to find a way to get through this. The Lupus Foundation of America is a great organization because they're getting people out there and letting people know what it's all about. And by knowing more, we'll be better able to help and unlock the mysteries that do surround lupus. There is something we can do. There is hope. Let's take this moment and turn it into a movement. End the confusion and end lupus. There is hope. We just have to get involved. I haven't given up. I challenge you to know no. 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 No, lupus. Go to lupus.org slash no and help solve this cruel mystery. Anxiety has affected me since really the beginning. I was dealing with this all by myself. I was totally isolated. Nobody knew. Everybody loved Shelby. She was a straight-A student, but a year ago, my sister lost her life to suicide. I know that my girlfriend struggled really hard with telling people she had this issue. She could hardly tell me. You know, it hurts me because I feel like a lot of my friends have struggled with not being able to admit that they're dealing with these issues. The last school year, there were four teen suicides that happened in Palo Alto. That really sent our entire community into a shock. Help us mind our future. Let's tag it. Tweet it. Share it. Instagram it. Let's snap it. Me importa el futuro. I think that social media is a very powerful tool for spreading these issues in a way that's approachable and also really powerful. These personal stories can become almost anthems or just rallying points for other people who feel the same thing. I did attempt suicide and I tried to end my life, but I bounced back. I'm really thankful that I saw that post because they might not think that they're helping me, but I really appreciated it so much. Shelby, I guess, never really felt that comfortable coming out and saying to us, you know, I've been really sad. I think, you know, there's something I need to do here. You know, if you take that step, take that initiative to reach out, you know, tell someone that you're struggling, it can make the biggest difference. I'm starting the conversation. I'm posting about mental health. I'm ending the stigma. We're, We're socializing hope. hope. I like that. Me importa el futuro. Together, we can bring change to mind. I think ending the stigma is the only way to start the conversation and have people feel comfortable enough. They can talk about it. They can seek help. Show us what you're doing to start the conversation and end the stigma. I say sickle cell don't control me, I control it. So anything that I put my mind to, I'm going to achieve. No matter how long it take, mm -hmm. no matter how hard it is, whatever I put my mind to and whatever I set to accomplish, I'm going to accomplish because sickle cell don't control me, I control it. Okay. Thank you. So the first time I think I remember I was about eight years old, and I'm in school, and I wasn't feeling well. So I went down to the nurse's office to find out that the nurse that would usually see me wasn't there. There was like a substitute nurse or whatever. And when I was explaining to her that you know I needed my medication for my pain, which they always had, she said, oh, what do you have? And I said, oh, I have sickle cell. And she responded by saying, is that contagious? <laughs> And I looked at her, and there was two other kids in the nurse's office. Yeah. And 
I, before I answered, I looked at the kids. The kids looked me up and down, looked at her, almost as if, oh, my God, is she, like, should I, like, be running? <laughs> and I looked at her and said, no, it's not contagious. What are you saying? And then the two kids left. You know, it just became a rumor, like I'm some type of contagious bacteria or something, you know? And I went home in tears that day, and let's just say my mom went the next day with like pamphlets <laughs> and, you know, everything to educate this woman. From that day forward, I always carry some type of materials or flyers, anything, so people can, you don't know about it, educate yourself. You know, don't, especially being a nurse, like you shouldn't, ask questions like that, you know, in front of other people, or at all, I mean, just, so that was my first experience with, you know, the community and her kind of putting me that in that situation. Then also growing up and missing a lot of school and my friends just saying, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you always, you know, missing school? I'm not feeling well. Oh, but my God, you're always sick. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, and um, growing up, I was teased a lot. Also, I had a lot of um, surgeries. So every time I had a surgery, I had to be out of the school for almost a month, month and a half, which also created problems with, I never got left back, but I, I always barely made it. I always said that I thought my teachers just felt sorry and they just passed me barely, you know, just because they felt bad for me. But, um, so yes, and then also when I would be home, and I remember this one time in the summer, my mom called the ambulance, and I'll never forget that day because in the summer around where I live, people are always outside, like listening to music, grilling, whatever. And they had me in this little chair stretcher. I'm crying hysterically, just like I'm in pain all over. And they passed me right in front of the building where everybody was there. And I just remember going, trying to cover myself, even though it wasn't gonna do much. And it was summer, so I didn't have a blanket, you know, to like. So after that, around the neighborhood, everyone was just like, oh my God, what's wrong with her? Are you okay? After that, they saw me and they would ask me, oh no, I'm okay. It wasn't until later, much older, that I had the courage to just say, yeah, I have sickle cell. And I would just tell people what it is, how it has affected me. Back then, I would hide it a little bit just because of the way people were treating me um also friends growing up as a teenager and dating you know in the community was very hard because you know that's not something you want to lead with like hi i'm doris and i have sickle cell you know <laughs> but then it's something that i can't really hide because eventually i'm gonna get sick and they're gonna look at me well why didn't you tell me what is it you know so i lost a lot of friends growing up just because they thought that I was just, I didn't want to go to their party or I didn't want to go to the movies with them because I would, we would make plans and then literally an hour before I would cancel. And so I guess it was a blessing because that showed me my true friends and my true, the true people around me that really loved me no matter my situation. Um, also in my, my whole family, since I was little, I was told, you're not gonna be able to have, to have a child. You will not be able to conceive. You're just gonna be too sick. No, no kids for you. Don't even think about it. Don't even dream about it. You're not gonna have a family. Just no. <laughs> so I grew up all my life thinking, at times I thought I just couldn't get pregnant. <laughs> like, okay, you know. But um, once I met my husband of, the, of now and I mean, that's my only husband, by the way. <laughs> but um, he, when we met, I had him get tested for the trait, because I told him, if you have the trait, then bye-bye. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to put like my own flesh and blood through what I've gone through. I'm OK. I'm alive. I've, it's made me stronger, but I'm not going to put my child through this. So thankfully, he does not have to trait. We have two beautiful daughters. I have a three-year-old, Amanda, and an eight-year-old, Angelica. Healthy, by the way. Healthy, beautiful girls. Um, but yeah, the community now embraces me in the sense that people around my, like my block, they go to the sickle cell walk. Some, some years they've gone, you know, if they see me walking outside and I'm a little, they say, are you okay? Like, and now I get a little too much attention because now they're looking out for me 
in ways that if I'm literally taking out a big juice out of the, free, the fridge in the grocery store, no, 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 let me help you. So just like, no, I, my arms work. I can get it. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you got to take and give and whatnot. But, um, but yeah, my community, I'm just, they know me as a very advocate for sickle cell. And I've actually um, helped some of them get tested for, to see if they carry the trait. And also the, mis the number one misconception in my community with sickle cell is that people with sickle cell trait think that they have the disease. Mm -hmm. I had a girl once tell me, um, we were talking about health and whatnot, and then she said, oh, but I have sickle cell. And I said, you do? Okay, how, how are you? You look great, like, you know, what's going on? She said, oh, no, but I don't get sick. I don't know what, like, what's the big deal? I don't, I never get sick. And I'm like, wait, what, are you SS, SC? What are, what do you have? I have the trait. No, honey, you have, that's not the disease. You carry the gene in your blood, but you don't have it. So sometimes I would be able to educate people and, you know, tell them really that they were not, they didn't have the disease. And other times, it, ignorance is blitz. Like, it was just too much for me to even try to open up their eyes, and I would just step back, because it would just frustrate me how people wouldn't, you know, want to actually research and learn exactly what is it that they have. Well, very briefly, um, even within the African American community, there is an, an ignorance, a lack of knowledge about what the disease is and how it affects people. So um, I think that talking about it is the greatest gift that we have to forward the message because um, I'm not being, I'm just not going to be politically correct here. Right now, sickle cell research and funding is lagging behind relatively newer diseases. And so, and that's nonsensical. So in my estimation, three things have to happen before we are in the place where we can try to play catch up and get the attention and some of the, the funding that we rightly deserve. And the first thing is awareness. Awareness only comes through people understanding and spreading a message. Once people are aware, they start to get uncomfortable. They start to get angry. I didn't know people were suffering like this. I didn't know that sickle cell could beget three or four more diagnoses so that the person is now walking around with effectively two or three diseases. And so then that anger leads people to act. But none of that succession doesn't happen without the awareness portion. So once we make people aware, they become angry and uncomfortable, and that leads them to act, to make laws, to talk to other people, to encourage their child to not, to, you know, when they go to school, not to be so judgmental about the child there who is struggling. So speaking about it is important because it also erases a lot of the stigmas that we've spoken about. And one of the greatest ones, again, that we, a lot of us suffer from is within our own medical community. And that affects us greatly because when we go into the hospital or the ER in a level 10 crisis where we are actively screaming, crying, sweating, and writhing, we need action. We don't need questions. We don't need this um, suspicion that we're here for the medicines because when you're in that act of distress, it's apparent that something needs to be done. So the more we talk about it, the more we educate even our own medical professionals, then the faster we get the, the resources that are rightly due to us and, in fact, overdue to us. I would say that it's important um, to share your story, to do things like this, just to be able to support one another. Um, one of the things, um, last, last October I had a friend, she had sickle cell, she passed away. And she was the person who helped me better understand my sickle cell, because as I told y'all before, my mom was very, like, you don't talk about it, you don't do that. So it's like I had my sister, and you know, I had my brother, but then as a man, he'd always try to downplay um, his illness or downplay when something happened to him. Like for example, his wife would be like, he'll have like a uh, crisis and he'll be like, oh, I have a Charlie horse. She's like, a Charlie horse can put you in the hospital. <laughs> like, you know, things like that. Um, so it's things that weren't talked about, but I feel like as, um, so being able to have her as that 
support system, like when things happen. So like she got her gallbladder removed before I did. So she was able, you know what I mean, to like talk to me about those types of things. And um, when I found out like about that I didn't have a spleen, like she had talked to me about like, so just having somebody that also understands and um, being able to be more open, because even um, as of now, so with her passing, um, I decided that I needed to become more active because that was something that me and her had been talking about, being more active and like sharing this story for being, you know what I mean, that spokesperson for being able to, you know what I mean, like show people that we're not alone, you know, and so that allows them to be able to be more open in terms of speaking and talking about what's happening to them. So it's just like she said, it's not a contagious disease. It's not anything that you need to be ashamed about. Mm -hmm. And so being able to be open and knowing like I, I shouldn't be ashamed about the fact that I have sickle cell. And by showing that I'm not ashamed about that, that allows other people to not be ashamed either and know like I can still live my life. I can still be able to live my dreams. I can still be able to um, you know what I mean, showcase, um, showcase what God has placed within me. And so I feel like that's one of the biggest things to me is to be able to allow other people to be able to come out. Because I know one of the things that you talked about earlier was the sense of you, you put limitations on yourself sometimes. Um, and then because other people talk about the fact that you're sick or you can't do this, you can't do that, then it becomes who you are. And so if you see people that are actually doing things, getting out there, it's like, oh, I can do that too. So you don't feel like, oh, I can't play sports, or I can't do this, or I can't do that because I have sickle cell, because that's what I've always been told. But when you start to see other people living their lives, um, experiencing different things, then that will push you to want to do that as well. So, Thank you. Is there anything else any other panel members want to add before we go to questions? Yes, I agree. Um, spreading awareness is important. Also, community support groups mm -hmm. is very important. Um, I just started a support group in the D.C. area, and it's called I Am Sickle Cell. And this, this support group also has a website where it showcases our spotlights, our talents. You know, it's so many people out here with sickle cell, so many of us that's entrepreneurs that have books that, that's doing a lot. And I think it's important for everyone to know what sickle cell is because when we come across people and they say, oh, I have sickle cell, and they say, oh, is it contagious? You know, and it's like, it's hurtful. So spreading awareness is important, but also support. And, and just to piggyback, even when we go to the emergency room or we go in an urgent care center and they say, oh, she has sickle cell, Sickle cell is not a generalized disease. It's an individualized disease. It affects each and every one of us differently, as you all heard. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just getting the respect and advocating for yourself first and then sharing with everyone else. We have to reach out to our legislators. We, we have to, you know, let our voices be heard. So we won't have to come across and say, oh, what is sickle cell? Everyone know what cancer is. Everyone know what HIV AIDS is. Everybody know what cystic fibrosis is. But sickle cell matters too. Thank you. Okay. You, I, just okay. Um, I just wanted to share one thing. Uh, the main, most of the time when people look at me or look at any of us, they say, well, you don't look sick. And that's kind of the sentence I get even from friends to doctors, nurses, you know, all the whole spectrum. And I just want to say, when we were younger, it was easier for us to physically look sick because we would cry, yell, you know, do. We were younger. We did. We thought by that we were going to, it was going to make it better. But as we grew older, we not only have become more tolerant to our pain, but we know that by crying and doing all those things, it's going to make it worse. So just because you don't see us in the state of, you know, ah, like crying and shivering up and things doesn't mean that we're not sick. And it's very hard when, you know, you, you're working or, you know, family function and people ask you, you okay? Just because you're quiet, you're okay, you sure? I'm okay, like, yeah, I'm good. And, but inside you're dying. So I, the main reason why I advocate so much besides for myself is for everyone else out there that, 
you know, that are, that is scared to come out and you know talk about their disease and tell even their family and friends. I have people that tell me, oh no, the only one that knows that I have sickle cell is my mom and my dad. Not even my sister, no one knows. And I'm like, but why? Why is it such a big secret? Like, it's not something that you, like, you didn't, let's say like with AIDS, that you did something to get it. No, you were just born with it. It's a genetic disorder. So don't be ashamed of it. And with doing uh, panels like this and others, we make our voices be heard and just find unity nationally.